Welcome everyone to this uh, very last substantive session um, as part of the conference, which will be on just transitions in fossil fuel dependent economies. My name is Cleo Vergel. I'm a scientist at the Stockholm Environment Institute. Um, and with SEI, I've been quite heavily involved in the UN Production Gap Report series over the past few years. And since its inception, this report has had a strong emphasis on the importance and relevance of considering just transition and explored how such a transition may play out in different settings. We've heard a lot about just transition already at this conference, which really underscores this topic as one of the most complex aspects of the transition we need to make, but also one of the most important ones. We know just transition is essential for its own sake, because we need to ensure no one is left behind as we pursue a more sustainable world. And we also know that just transition is very important for pragmatic reasons, to ensure societal support as we embark on the necessary transformation to a net zero world. At the same time, it's important to remember where we're starting from. As we were reminded this morning, the current fossil fueled world is neither just nor sustainable. And it's also important to break down the concept of just transition as the panelists in the previous sessions in this room reminded us. Whose just transition are we talking about and how do we ensure the concept remains rich and meaningful and not just a catchphrase? So I'm very excited to welcome a great lineup of speakers whose presentations will span a range of geographies from Australia to Colombia to the US and Canada. And they will be discussing a range of themes that will help us get to the heart of challenges to a just transition. So on our panel today, we have Felipe Corral Montoya, who is a PhD candidate at the Te Technische Universität in Berlin. And he'll be speaking about experiences from Colombian fossil fuel extracting regions and what they can teach us about energy transitions in the global south. We have Josh Axelrod right next to him who is a senior advocate at the Natural Resources Defense Council. And Josh will be discussing options for fossil dependent economies within existing legal frameworks in the US. Uh, next to Josh, we have Emiliano. Emiliano Castillo Yara is a PhD candidate at the University of Trier. And he'll be discussing his paper on competing notions of energy justice around tar sands development in Canada. And we'll have Julia Schwab. Julia is a research fellow and doctoral candidate at the Justus Liebig Universität in Gießen. And she'll be exploring what makes the energy transition so difficult in extractivist states. And finally, we'll hear from Claire Feissen. And Claire is co-head of the climate policy team at Climate Analytics. And she'll be exploring narratives of gas as a bridging fuel in Western Australia. It's great to have you all here. Uh, as you know, we have about 10 minutes per presentation, and I'll give a little sign uh, as time uh, starts to wind down. And um, we'll first hear from all the speakers before moving to discussion and Q&A. With that, I uh, welcome Felipe as our first speaker. Thank you very much uh, for, for having me here. Uh, I will be talking today about the, the challenges for, for transitions in Colombia. And first, I want to do a disclaimer. Uh, to, we've heard all, all across uh, the past day and a half that uh, transitions go far beyond uh, only overcoming or, or uh, dealing with fossil fuel phase out. But today, <laughs> I'm sadly only going to be able to focus on that. And today, I want to present a little bit of our ongoing research uh, from, analysis, from an analysis of transition discourses uh, in Colombian uh, minerals and energy policy that I've done with colleagues at uh, Technische Universität Berlin and Europa Universität Flensburg. So I will go directly into uh, the context, and that is that of, of Colombia, which is a rather average uh, uh, fossil fuel dependent country. But I want to uh, focus here on, on what do we mean when we talk about fossil fuel dependency? Because when we talk about energy transition, and this is a, a very uh, popular uh, a chart of, of a Sankey diagram that shows uh, energy flows in the economy. We look at the fact that uh, here, 
<laughs> most of the energy, the primary energy that, that is produced in Colombia actually flows out of Colombia in the form of fossil fuel exports. So in the uh, strict sense, the transition here is not so much about the energy that is consumed domestically, which is still a, a part of the, of the process, but about all the exports. A different way of looking at this uh, comes from this, this chart on the, the trade basket of, of Colombia, where you can see that not only uh, it relies on, uh, mostly on crude and, and coal exports for, for, for its exports, but that about 80% of Colombian total exports are coming from commodities and, and raw materials. So what is the transition uh, really about in, in this context, understood transition as a uh, overcoming fossil fuel extraction? Well, it's not so much about energy. Um, so transitions in fossil fuel uh, rent dependent countries are uh, more about the dependence on external income from fossil fuel sales than from the actual use of these fossil fuels uh, as energy domestically. So this has to do on one hand with trade, no, and the balance of payment situation. So Colombia has a very important trade deficit, but also it has a current account a deficit. That means we need foreign capital to do our domestic investments and we need foreign uh, borrowing to fund our uh, trade deficits. So th thus it touches upon the fact that uh, we have to deal or perhaps also question our insertion in the global uh, market system. Also, the transition in this context deals with the respective countries' fiscal situation and, of course, the importance of fossil fuel income in government expenditure. And finally, these transitions uh, are seldomly considered in their complexity. <laughs> For example, beyond installing renewables at, at massive uh, scales, uh, especially in international debates and domestic policy. So why focus on Colombia if it is only an average fossil fuel rent dependent country? So, yeah, as I was saying, in the, in the past year, 46% of total exports come from uh, coal and oil. Fossil fuels, mainly oil, uh, are also source of about 15% of national government income. This year, that figure may go up considerably. Uh, third, fossil fuel producing subnational entities rely on oil and coal extraction for over 40% of GDP. So there's an econo a dependence on economic activity generated by fossil fuel extraction and, and external sale. And public administrations in fossil fuel producing areas such as Cesar and, and La Guajira that uh, Jose was talking about before um, are highly reliant on fossil fuel rents to function. So the amount of a budget from these subnational entities coming from external sale of, of, of coal or, or uh, oil in other regions uh, is very high, sometimes going to 80% of total uh, local budget, which is uh, huge. Finally, and as we were hearing in the panel that took place uh, uh, before here, Colombia, while it is an important exporter of coal, it is rather a peripheral actor that does not set neither the price nor the consumption demand in global markets, but it has to accept whatever it is. And it is a country that definitely cannot control the pace of the European and North American energy transition. So whatever the pace of that transition is, that's the pace we have to deal with in our own coal transition. And at the same time, if we look at oil, we have dwindling oil reserves, which uh, are in, in danger of um, uh, being dried up in the course of the next seven to eight years. But an, op an unprecedented opportunity has opened. And this is a little bit why uh, we want to, to talk about Colombia. We are an average fossil fuel a rent dependent country, but we are the first country where a national government uh, uh, was elected explicitly running on the promise of phasing out coal as soon as possible, not granting any new oil or gas contracts for exploration and extraction, and thus being the f one of the first countries of actually implementing the, the recommendations by the net zero roadmap, banning fracking, and reorientating the economy away from what uh, they call us extracting. So you can, now you can take the picture if you want. Um, 
And for those of you that follow Colombian uh, politics or the United Nations General Assembly, it, it also was a government that very quickly started pushing with its uh, discourse uh, at a um, global level, say, slamming this addiction to irrational power and uh, profit making that uh, countries in the global north uh, have, criticizing and comparing the, the poison that uh, is embodied by cocaine with the poison that is coal and oil. And this um, is, was one of the motivations that led us to uh, look at the discourses that are uh, ongoing on, on energy transition in Colombia. So what does discourse analysis re reveal about the broader energy transition trajectories or policies uh, of, of fossil fuel rent dependent countries. So first, discourses reveal what is being prioritized by decision makers. You know, what is on top of their minds, but also on top of their wallets and uh, what is uh, uh, keeping their, their attention. Second, what is being neglected? Who is being neglected in, in, in these documents, in the implementation of the different government plans, amongst others? And third, uh, which justification is given to legitimize proposed policies in one or other directions? So our analysis uh, began to look at different documents on mining and energy policy related to transitions in the period between the last uh, presidential election in 2019 and the current uh, electoral cycle in 2022, including policy documents, laws, government plans by main presidential contenders. It, that, that means those that participate in this in the um, second round of the elections, as well as some a selection of articles in the main newspapers. And we have three main discourses uh, that we identified emerging from our preliminary analysis. First, that fossil fuels are essential and a continued element of transition. So that means Colombia, uh, in, in several policy documents we reviewed, is framed as an already front runner as our power system is mostly clean, so no big transition is needed because we already have a clean electricity matrix. And here you have very interesting government documents uh, um, showing their, their proudness about this. Second, that the fiscal income from fossil fuels is needed to fund transition. So if we phase out uh, fossil fuels, we're not going to have the money to build renewables. Third, the, that gas is a crucial transition fuel. This resonates with what uh, Claudio was presenting this, this morning, that still plays a role not only in all energy policy plans, but all in all climate policy plans, because it's so much better than coal. Recall that we don't use the coal. Finally, that fossil fuel supply explicitly uh, is to be excluded from climate policy uh, as it is an economic inconvenience. And here again, Claudia already presented this in the morning. Um, they literally said, if we were to, to include fossil fuel supply into our calculations, it would either mean some kind of, of econ less reduced economic growth or um, uh, uh, a considerable uh, shift in our political priorities. And that's why we're excluded from our uh, long-term uh, transition strategy. The second one uh, uh, talks about diversification of commodity dependence. So this means diversifying, for example, what they call our mineral basket and say, now we're not going to extract coal, but we're going to also begin extracting all kinds of other metallic ores, including copper, for the sake of the energy transition. And second, that we're going to uh, begin producing hydrogen, initially blue, also in considering the gasification of coal, as a, as a potential revenue source, but in the future also green hydrogen as a potential source of exports to fill the gaps left by reduced oil, uh, oil and coal. And this is coming from the, um, from the uh, roadmap for, for hydrogen in Colombia. Mm, yeah. And the third one is this idea of uh, reorientating the economy beyond commodity dependence. So this includes shifting from what the discourse says an, an extractivist to a productive economy, overcoming what they call the rentier arrangement in local and national fi public financing, so overcoming the, the reliance on, on oil and gas and coal rents, 
transitioning to a society entirely powered by wind, water, and sun. And finally, also limiting natural resource extraction to the necessary while focusing on satisfying Colombia's local needs. If you want to read, uh, it's all there. So what happens now? We find that uh, while this sounds very rosy and very positive, in the past, there was a neo-extractivist turn in the previous pink wave, in the previous uh, arrival of left for and progressive forces in Latin America, that after mentioning all these climate protection things actually turned and uh, began re reliant on the extraction appropriation of these rents for social purposes initially, but maintaining this, this arrangement of, of fossil uh, de dependency. So a break in the, in the discourse from previous government is necessary, but is not sufficient. We need also meaningful material policies that, are, uh, that have to be introduced so that the, the current trajectories change. But we, we are not sure which ones or how. We only know that they def de definitely have to touch upon these three points, trade, taxes, and the relations to territory, which would warrant a whole other uh, uh, presentation, but I, my time, time is already off, so thank you. Thank you, Felipe, for the reminder that we need meaningful policies as well as slogans. Josh, on to you. Thank you all for uh, sticking with us to the end of the conference in this last session. Uh, I wanted to start out by thanking my colleague, uh, Claudia Blanco Nunez, who's not here, who, who helped do a lot of background research uh, in support of this presentation. Um, today, I'm going to focus on US oil production and specifically a uh, subset of that production, which is the federal onshore oil and gas program. Um, so this is the oil and gas program controlled by the federal government. When people talk about Biden approving oil, this is what that is. Um, and uh, that as a basically a means to focus advocacy on the supply side and look at just transition. So let's see if this works. So just briefly, US oil production. Uh, the time scale is arbitrary here. I chose it simply because federal data is only good back, uh, robust back to 2003 uh, in, the, in the various uh, public reporting uh, uh, sources we have. So, you know, you've seen this drastic increase in U.S. oil production over the last almost 20 years. Um, you can see in the pie chart there that the U.S. is the largest oil producer uh, in the world by a factor of almost 200 percent now compared to its, its closest rivals, Saudi Arabia and Russia. Um, that's probably widened because this is 2021. Oil production in the U.S. has grown substantially over the last year and is expected to continue growing for at least one more year. Um, down there in the bottom, so the purple uh, is, the this is cumulative, but the purple is the federal offshore, so that is a slightly larger chunk of the federal, of, uh, federal production than the onshore, and the federal onshore is the red portion, and the red, that represents about 10% of current U.S. Uh, daily production. So just quickly, where is oil produced in the U.S.? Um, it's produced currently in 27 of 50 states. Um, Texas is obviously the largest. 40% of our oil is produced there. Uh, the next two largest producers are New Mexico and North Dakota, and they rec represent an additional 20%. So three states. Uh, account for 60% of U.S. oil production. Um, I'm going to, though, drill down a little more. So this is looking at federal onshore production now. Um, so this is production coming from federal, federally managed lands. And that there's an agency in the U.S. called the Bureau of Land Management. They are responsible for managing the oil and gas program. 74% of that production is coming from two states, New Mexico and Wyoming. And actually, if I, if I included um, North Dakota, we'd capture almost all of it. Um, I don't include North Dakota for both, both because geographically it's slightly different, politically it's very different, and it has, um, it's also a very kind of flash in the pan oil producing state. It's not expected, its um, oil reserves will be tapped out fairly quickly. Uh, New Mexico and Wyoming are different in that regard. Um, so, um, let's see. 
so looking at this, it, you know, it a, a lot the advocacy focus of um, U.S. environmental organizations has looked at onshore oil and gas, um, the onshore oil, oil and gas program for a long time. It's long been seen as a kind of the low hanging fruit to go after supply and really bring about a phase down. And um, you can kind of see, and and that that includes focus work in certain states. Um, New Mexico has be, has gone from being a kind of a negligible oil producer to the second largest oil producer in the country. Um, so it's created a new challenge, a new jurisdiction to work in. Wyoming has is not a very big producer, but has a, a very long extractive legacy, and of course was a major is a major coal producing state. Um, but that being said, um, though the federal estate is a prime focus um, for advocacy, uh, I just wanted to kind of walk through some of the barriers. And these are extremely high level, but um, there are some pretty severe uh, legal barriers to, to kind of directly going after supply um, from federal lands. Um, so first, under US federal law, um, the Bureau of Land Management, the BLM, is, is required to cons at least consider holding an oil and gas lease every single quarter, um, so long as lands are available for leasing. Under current land use plans, about 80% of public lands, which is hundreds of millions of acres, are open and available for leasing. So uh, that's not currently a limitation. That the law invests them with discretion to kind of shape the size of those leases. Um, the Biden administration has attempted to do that, but they, of course, were immediately taken to court. They lost in court. Um, unclear whether that really changed changed much, but it certainly it made them feel like they were compelled to then move forward with with an onshore lease sale and an offshore lease sale, both of which have happened um, in the last year. Um, then a, <laughs> there's been a lot of discussion about the Inflation Reduction Act and its positives, but it, inc it includes a, um, a hostage clause for oil and gas leasing. So now um, for federal um, renewable energy projects, if the federal gov government wishes to issue a permit for those projects, it must first show that it has held an oil and gas lease sale within a certain amount of time. It's 120 days. Um, so uh, kind of an, uh, if the federal government wanted to issue uh, permits for wind, onshore wind or solar, let's say three times a year, they would have to hold three um, oil and gas lease sales as well. Unclear, and, and there are um, size limitations on that. It's very complex. Um, it's very poorly written, but it's, it's a huge, huge new barrier to not only a tr transition to renewable energy, but also a transition away from kind of our um, status quo, lease a lot of public lands, approve a lot of new drilling. Um, so basically, just the takeaway there is that federal law provides no uh, legal mechanism to affirmatively stop leasing. It must continue. Um, a number of other factors come into play, which I'll go into a little bit more. State budgets, uh, especially New Mexico and Wyoming, are currently geared uh, and shaped by money coming from federal payments to those states. Um, in these two sp states specifically, uh, the public education, the public health system, and other essential services are all um, tied to federal disbursements from fossil fuels. Uh, so if those disbursements go away, the, the harm is done to those public services. Um, similarly, workforces are impacted. Uh, New Mexico's economy is fairly diversified, but, but Wyoming's is not. Uh, it's a fairly substantial uh, percentage of the workforce works in extractive industry, either coal or oil and gas. And then finally, just general economic preparedness. The United States, uh, despite our wealth, despite <laughs> um, you know all, all of the resources we have, is extremely unprepared for any kind of transition. We saw that with the inv uh, with Russia's invasion of Ukraine, we had no uh, kind of central policy response that could really help people deal with the energy shock that happened. And um, you know, I think that's something to keep in mind. I, it's of course even more so true for for poorer countries, but we are just not ready. There is not a transit option. There is not um, an alternative energy. Um, option, et cetera. And there's also a weak federal government that can't uh, impose, impose all of that. So the question really begs the question, if the laws uh, aren't favorable, is a transition possible? And 
I would say yes, but it requires, um, aye, aye, aye. okay, work along, um, three main paths. Um, first, yes, legal hooks must be used to the extent they're available, um, and this requires some very creative campaigning um, to limit production and avoid lock-in. Second, um, policies and state budgets need to be disentangled. I would argue this doesn't require an act of law. You don't necessarily need to reform tax policy, which is politically toxic in the US. But you know you could design a state budget so that the way revenues are flowing, um, that you're kind of most sensitive and uh, um, state services are not tied to fossil fuels so that those two, their um, fates aren't intertwined. And third, I, I would say then, just transition and the principles of just transition need to guide decision making and thinking about how to address state policy. So I'm going to quickly focus on the latter two um, and skip a few things. But this um, up here on the top is this: these are federal payments um, to uh, Wyoming as the green line, New Mexico as the blue line. You can see how so New Mexico is very dependent on oil and gas, and you can see how as the price of oil and gas has fluctuated, the payments have fluctuated quite a bit, despite the fact that if you were to graph um, New Mexico's production line on there, it would go continually up. So despite that, the payments have not been consistent. Wyoming, what you see there, the peak, that was the peak of coal for the state. And, and as coal has declined, the state's kind of economic fortunes have just gone completely into the basement and you know had very little hope of recovery there and they are trying to kind of become more dependent on oil and gas. Um, I was going to quickly talk about some uh, jurisdictions that have decoupled, um, and this also includes some, some work, work uh, in New Mexico itself, but we can talk about that um, during questions. I just want to um, close basically by saying um, uh, just one more. Here we go. Yes, that as we think about just transition, we have to think about what 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 is happening. Is is the transition that's happening so far just? And this is looking at the overall U.S. workforce, which is pretty evenly. We saw a very similar slide in a in a presentation in the um, Shulman just before this. The overall U.S. workforce is fairly evenly divided among um, men and women. The energy workforce is not. The fossil fuel workforce, uh, predominantly white men. Surprise, surprise, the, the clean energy workforce is looking about the same. Um, and so it, it begs the question of, as we pour resources into job training, into um, building out this new economy, this new workforce, and of so much attention gets paid on, on these transition jobs and how they're better jobs or can be made better, who's, who's benefiting? And right now, the answer is white men. Um, and and a lot of attention goes to, to um, you know, helping fossil fuel workers, again, who are fossil fuel workers, white men. And a lot of US policy of co is, of course, favorable to, to that demographic. And so I think this is a, a key consideration as we think about uh, just transition. Um, and so this list uh, is, I thought this was a really great list. It's, from, um, it's adapted from the Just Solutions Collective and Equity Fund. Um, seven kind of questions or principles to consider uh, in a just transition. I, I think a lot of discussion at this conference has been about affirmative policy that is just transition, but I would argue that policy, it, if policymakers ask themselves these questions, the, their policy might come out more just in, in inevitably because I think they, they require um, careful consideration. And so, um, I, I think a lot of this has to do with a focal shift in how we think about policy. Is it purely, are we solving a purely economic problem? Or are we solving a, a justice problem? And if, if the answer is the latter, then you know these kind of considerations apply to economic and social policy. I think lay the groundwork for a more organic tr transition that is not, um, not as dependent on this kind of uh, top-down management approach of like we have we have X number of barrels that must be slowly phased out. We have no legal, legal mechanism to do so. If instead it's we must prepare the economy or our, our society for a transition so that when, as that transition happens, it doesn't kind of force us into these cycles of extractivism, um, 
we're able to kind of proceed forward in a more resilient uh, way and also avoid that model being applied to the clean energy sector, which it is currently, um, there's a major risk of that happening. So thank you. Great. Thank you so much, Josh, and for really honing down on some of the elements we need to consider in a just transition. Um, Julian, Emiliano, you've swapped places. So have you guys decided amongst you who will go first? Right. Hello, everybody. I'm going to present today a work uh, paper I'm working on at the moment with my colleague Nadia Kombarisa, who's not here today, um, about the blinkers, so the narrow perspective, the thing that horses wear sometimes, right, of planning for climate change. And we argue in that paper that these blinkers impede a more effective climate action and also impede a just energy transition, especially for extractivist states in the global south and this work builds on a previous paper we have published a policy brief about the just transition from a global south perspective and that's why i first want to um, give to you the most important points of that previous work to then go on to this current paper and probably you will understand then a little bit more why we do this research at the moment so to start with some developments that can be expect expected from the energy transition, I think we heard it a lot. So we frame this, these developments as a reloaded extractivism that can be expected. So on the one hand, a boosted green extractivism for critical minerals like lithium, copper and so on. And then on the other hand, uh, short term intensified fossil fuel extractivism in order to quote, extract every single drop of oil we have left, as the um, president of Ecuador has said some months ago and thereby kind of confirmed our hypothesis we had there. Well, so this context is the context of most countries in the global south, either because of fossil fuel dependency, um, like producer countries, but also when we think about Chile, for example, that has not fossil fuels, but a lot of copper and lithium. So, um, this context is, however, as we found in dominant narratives about the just transition on the international level, um, not included or even ignored, one might say. Um, dominant narratives revolve mainly about top, um, techno optimism, um, the idea of win-win situations where there's no loser in the transition at all, uh, reformism, and the assumption that this transition is taking place in um, democratic liberal market economies with a very strong public sector that is willing and able to afford and support such a transition. So I think we can all agree that these assumptions are quite Eurocentric and also very elitist. And so they are aiming in the end maintaining the status quo in a new green economy that's actually not that new when we think about it. It seems like a version of the old economy we already know, but with new energy sources. So, of course, there are criticisms of these dominant narratives. We heard some of them the last two days. Um, just very shortly, there's obviously a danger of cooptation of these discourses, um, focusing the sh um, shifting the focus away from the just and just transition to more technocratic deba debates about technological solutions. And also that this discursive power then leads to a more reactive focus, ignoring the existing and past injustices that we should maybe also tackle and take into account. And yes, so this just transition is obviously not happening in a vacuum. And if we don't address now these injustices, they will be extrapolated into the future. However, these criticism, as we have analyzed in a, um, we, like we reviewed all um, papers, like in different journals, where these criticisms were made, like from the scientific community. And most of these criticisms are made at least like in institution that publish them in the global north. So um, they are of course really valid and important, but I think it becomes clear that the just transition in the global south is not yet discussed enough from the scientific community, but also like on the international level, I think. And so what we concluded there in this policy brief is that what is needed when we talk about just transition from a global south perspective um, is a global, holistic and decolonial perspective. So real short, I think it's maybe quite straightforward. Um, a global perspective entails global south inequalities, the issue of externalization, not just when we think about emissions and climate change, but also in the so-called green economy, 
um, there are also going to be externalizations. A holistic perspective that takes into account the whole life cycle of energy, starting with the energy extractive nexus. I think that became quite clear in your presentation as well. Um, and of course, a power perspective on this whole issue. So where are the roots of these problems? And uh, what has that maybe to do with the decolonization we might need, or I think we do need, for the energy system um, in general? So this as a quick overview. Now I want to take a step back. That's what we did with my colleague. We ended this policy brief and then we were like, okay, maybe we have to look a little bit deeper into why the energy transition or now the just transition is framed as the solution. So to what problem is that the solution? Because when we look a little bit closer into problem formulations, we see that they just allow us then to frame solutions in a certain way and just enable us to see maybe a certain picture that's limited. That's why I want to talk about the blinkers, right? So um, the first blinker we have identified and I want to share with you is the power of Euromodernity and this epistemological project. So Euromodernity means um, it's like based on idea of a thought collective from different Latin American intellectuals and is basically very closely tied to European Enlightenment and the idea from René Descartes, a French philosopher, who was one of the first people writing about that nature is inherently separated from society. So this nature-culture divide. And this has, um, this has ever since influenced like the division of natural science from the social sciences and humanities, for example. So how we think, like the epistemologies, how we think, how we analyze, what problems we see, which we don't see, for example, or how we all are also divided in different disciplines here as well. And we notice quite quick like that people use different terminologies and think in different ways. So um, these blinkers blanket any normativity and portray natural science as very objective, while maybe in the humanities it's more accepted to have like a kind of normative stance on some of our findings. And in the IPCC, I think it's very well um, reflected as well that there's not any normativity kind of allowed or seen that there are maybe interests involved, economic, political interests and so on. And I think the following quote exemplifies these dynamics quite well. So Norton says there, we usually in contentious situations, take the climate or the energy crisis, for example, define a problem as the lack of our favorite solution. Our solution are clean energies and our problem is then the lack of clean energies. Um, rather than providing a thoughtful analysis of the values threatened, in such situations no clear view of the real problem will emerge and rational analysis, however sophisticated, cannot be brought to bear upon these situations. So apparently we don't see the whole picture, right? So we don't see the real problem at stake and that's why we thought, well, if the energy transition is a symptom of climate change, what is climate change a symptom of? And that led us to the concept of, of the imperial mode of living from Brandt and Wissen um, that is basically um, revolving around three main pillars. The first one are crisis deepening patterns of consumption and production. Um, so basically extractivist practices that rely on the exploitation of nature but also human beings. Um, a notorious externalization of environmental harms as in climate change, but also when we think about national or global sacrifice zones in remote areas and the expansion of the capitalist extractive frontier to always more remote areas. And here I don't just talk about maybe the Atacama Desert or the Amazon like rainforest, but also deep sea mining that's heavily pushed by Shell recently. Very interesting to think. Um, or also that idea that we can colonize space and mine the moon one day. So um, when we look at this, it maybe does, it's not that new after all, right? It kind of seems familiar. And then we, we are suddenly there and think, yeah, maybe the imperial mode of living is a symptom of neo-colonialist practices and historical colonialism more generally. And so we see that the cause and consequence domino is maybe not just a linear line, that would be like the Eurocentric and Euro-modern way of thinking, like, oh, it's a line, right? We like that, it's ordered, it's easy, 
it's not that simple. It rather looks like this crazy domino thing on the bottom. It's very complex, very messy, and we have to think about a lot of things, but that's difficult. So um, I think the takeaway from this is then that um, climate change and the energy transition need to be situated in a historical and social context. And we need to be aware that finding fixes to the climate problem cannot be separated from existing social political inequalities. And if we do so, this leads our decision making into a technocratic trap in the end. So the blinker here is obviously the imperial mode of living, as I already said, that narrow, narrows our perspective here. So climate change turns into an isolated problem of environmental nature, disembedded from its socio-cultural roots in the imperial mode of living and colonialism. So the last blinker, and then I'm going to end, um, is again this Cartesian divide of nature culture. But this time, I want to put it into context with um, the solutions that are presented for climate change. And these solutions are always either mitigation or adaptation. And they, um, this response then again to the separation, not thinking both things together. And especially when it comes to, well, I think there's overly like global focus like heavily on mitigation. So also Global South countries are used for the mitigation of Global North emissions. And when it comes to adaptation, I think there's a really missed opportunity to maybe push for more radical in the sense of the word, like root solutions. Um, instead, it's rather like of reformist character. And so I think that's my conclusion that um, climate solution rather aim at maintaining and sustaining the status quo and a capitalist extractivist model than um, really aiming for transformative action. Thank you. Thank you, Julia. That was an excellent warning of the possibility of co-optation of different narratives as well. Emiliano, over to you. So thank you for, for being here. Uh, and this paper is, uh, sorry, this presentation is based uh, on a paper that I and my uh, supervisor at the University of Trier uh, published on the journal Futures as part of a, of an, a special issue on just energy futures. And um, this paper sought uh, to contribute to uh, and further theoretical discussion on conflicts over uh, tar sands pipelines in Canada um, in the fields of uh, energy justice and energy futures um, by exploring how uh, or the mobilization or articulation and mobilization of uh, competing notions of justice and future visions um, in the conflict over the government-owned uh, transmountain pipeline expansion in the province of uh, British Columbia, Canada. So we focus on this uh, particular case because of the following reasons. Uh, first, um, uh, this project has been quite controversial in recent years. So while the um, federal government, um, the provincial government of Alberta and the oil industry um, consider this uh, pipeline as, uh, as a project of national interest because it supposedly contributes to economic growth, uh, job creation and increased tax revenues. Uh, and the US people, uh, particularly some First Nations, uh, environmental organizations um, and citizens, well, they argue that um, at this pipeline, um, while well, it further accelerates climate change, it undermines indigenous land rights and it poses uh, risks uh, to the marine ecosystems in BC uh, due to potential oil spills and increased tanker traffic. Uh, second, um, in what is now known as uh, British Columbia, um, First Nations uh, have never ceded their land so meaning that their governments and, and, and legal systems uh, were never extinguished. And um, so the, the, the Canadian government must obtain their consent uh, for decisions about the use of their land. Um, and this significantly affects um, the legitimacy of uh, the Canadian uh, state's uh, assertion of territorial sovereignty. And the third is that um, 
this uh, Trans Mountain Pipeline expansion or TMX uh, is the last remaining uh, large scale pipeline project proposed by, by uh, the Canadian state. Um, because the other projects were um, cancelled due to the opposition of uh, indigenous people and environmental organizations. Um, and I saw it, I think this, I mean, despite the fact that uh, the federal government uh, of Canada approved this project, um, this case study shows uh, the key role of these indigenous led movements in preventing the expansion of uh, unconventional or fossil fuel infrastructure across Canada. Um, through blockades, um, street demonstrations, uh, rallies and other strategies. And the main goal of this, uh, or this leads me to the research question of this of the paper, which were, or the main question, which was um, how what we call the anti-TMX movement uh, mobilizes uh, plural or different uh, conceptions of justice in the conflict over, over this pipeline to articulate uh, different um, visions of the future, right? So I think that's, that, that's um, the main research question. And before I move on, just I'd like to give you some background information. Um, so where are Tarsans and where are they found? Well, as you can see on the, light, on the left side, uh, uh, tar sands are a mixture of uh, water, clay, and bitumen. Bitumen is oil that must be diluted or heated before it can be used to produce uh, usable fuels such as gasoline. Now, Canada has uh, the world's uh, largest tar sands reserves that are located in the province of Alberta, as you can see on the right side. Um, and well, tar sands are uh, quite controversial because they. Uh, release uh, more greenhouse gas emissions than conventional oil and therefore contribute to climate change. Uh, this is illustrated in, um, in the picture on, on the left uh, of a refinery in, in Alberta. And uh, they also lead to deforestation, water pollution, um, and conflicts uh, you know, between the oil industry, uh, First Nations, and um, the Canadian government over land, uh, land rights, uh, which is illustrated on, on the right side uh, in the picture of this uh, tar sands mining in Alberta. Um, and um, here in this map, um, we can see the, the, in red the existing uh, pipelines or tar sands pipeline, crude oil pipelines in Canada. And well, in Canada, in the United States. And the key point to bear in mind here is that most of these projects are uh, designed to meet the US energy needs. Uh, and also that uh, these projects turn um, indigenous lands and also uh, neighborhoods into sacrifice zones for uh, the oil and for the oil industry and for our countries as uh, indigenous people or, or marginalized communities or you know, regular citizens, they pay the price for the oil consumption uh, in, in the United States or in, or in other countries. So um, the important thing also is to consider uh, the TMX struggle as part of this international um, efforts by uh, different groups to stop uh, you know the, the, the expansion of these fossil fuel uh, infrastructures across North America and in the case of the pi the TMX pipeline well we can see here hit um, it go it runs well if uh, constructed it uh, will run from Edmonton, Alberta, and the Tar Sands, uh, through uh, British Columbia, and then uh, it ends at um, a marine terminal in Burnaby. Um, and you know, in this map, we all, we also can see uh, some of the First uh, Nations communities that have opposed uh, this project. Of course, they have quite different uh, uh, views on these projects. Um, and some of are against, or others are uh, in favor of these projects. Uh, and now, uh, just uh, I want to mention this aspect of uh, Canada's energy vision. Uh, so the, the the important thing is here is that uh, consider how this uh, energy vision is based or on the assumption that 
Tarsan's uh, development is necessary for economic de economic development or for creating jobs and even pro uh, for protecting the environment. <clears throat> As we can see in this uh, uh, quote from uh, uh, Prime Minister Trudeau, in which uh, it says that the TMX will contribute uh, to cleaner energy development in Canada. Um, and for example, here we can see like the contrast, this different uh, perspective on the TMX, which consider this project not only as uh, something that uh, reproduces uh, climate injustice, but it is also part of this uh, settler colonial project aimed at uh, removing indigenous people from their lands uh, for uh, resource development pro purposes. Um, and it also highlights how some of these uh, of the groups that are part of this anti-TMX movement are also trying to build alternatives to fossil fuel infrastructures by developing their own uh, community-led uh, renewable energy projects. And because, yeah, because of the time constraints, I just uh, want to mention that, um, I mean, for, for this paper, uh, we sought to contribute to discussions in energy justice and energy futures um, by problematizing um, like the epistemolo epistemological foundations of these uh, two different uh, frameworks because they are still based on uh, Western understandings of justice and energy futures. And by that, I mean that, um, for example, energy justice, uh, energy futures is mostly uh, based on the idea that of developing a different kind of uh, technological systems that could in theory, replace fossil fuel uh, power systems. Um, and energy justice, while well, it's useful because it draws attention to, for example, the unequal distribution of uh, socioecological costs related, uh, associated with energy development and the decisions that are, or the uneven making power, or uneven uh, power relations in uh, energy policy making, um, the, they are still not considering like the different uh, values, worldviews, or uh, perspective of justice um, that you know people on the ground have and here some of the for example uh, other papers that also focuses on, on these issues they tend to uh, incorporate these theoretical frameworks uh, without questioning um, and then uh, to answer our research question we will we use uh, critical discourse analysis also uh, participant observations and some interviews as well as document analysis. And here uh, is a table that uh, summarizes some of these uh, interpretations of justice. Um, it has to do, for example, with uh, indigenous self-determination, land sovereignty, uh, the relationships uh, and responsibilities to nature, and the importance of um, also developing community-led uh, renewable energy projects has also to do with uh, gender violence because all of these aspects are not considered in, in the official uh, reports uh, of this project. Um, and just finally, I um, think that the most important thing here to remember is that, well, this um, particularly indigenous perspective challenge the, the theoretical frameworks of energy justice and energy futures by you know, drawing attention to these multiple understandings of justice and when we talk about just energy futures, we're not also, uh, I mean, we're also talking about, um, you know, dismantling the power uh, structures underpinning, uh, um, you know, energy systems. And yeah, I think that's it. <laughs> Thank you. Thanks so much, Emiliano. And I think that it was a great follow on from Julia's presentation, uh, discussing the different ways and conceptions of justice and what we can learn from indigenous perspectives as well. All right, hi everyone. Um, I am really standing on the shoulders of giants presenting work by colleagues, um, Victor Maxwell, Anna Chapman, Bill Hare, and many others. So please don't ask me any complicated questions. Um, so yeah, unpacking fossil gas as a bridge fuel. I think we probably don't need to go much into the context. Um, the reasons we wanted to focus on fossil gas is that we've seen growing awareness of the need to phase out coal. But there's still a lot of proponents, we've heard many reasons, I think, over the course of the last two days, um, pushing for fossil gas to maintain a role in the energy system as a replacement for coal, as a way to abate hard to abate sectors, um, as a 
you know, cleaner option in the future as a mode of sustainable development. And we really, the evidence is really pointing towards it not being a clean fuel. So it's contributed nearly 50% of the growth in fossil CO2 emissions over the past few years. Um, it's not um, associated with um, energy security or um, stability. And, and critically, it's not consistent with a 1.5 degree compatible future. And um, just to demonstrate that, you can see in this figure in the greys, um, the um, existing gas fields and uh, planned gas fields over the future over the next um, couple of decades and then in comparison the light green dotted line it shows a median of IPCC 1.5 compatible pathways um, that we've, we've filtered based on sustainability criteria and you can see that really in that 1.5 degree world there is not space to use all of those gas fields. Um, just, I'd like to point your attention to the red line, um, the IEA um, sustainable development scenario, which some um, energy companies, for example, have used as justification for the need for more gas in the future. Um, but colleagues of mine, um, Robert Bretcher and colleagues, have um, run this through a climate model and shown that it's really not 1.5 compatible and there is a significant uh, risk of warming going above two degrees in that scenario. So it's definitely not one to aim for. Um, Part of the reason that we see this rapid decline in um, gas in a 1.5 degree future is in the power system. And just a very quick plug for a report that we released earlier this year um, that looked at the role of gas in, in power sector in 1.5 degree scenarios. Um, gas um, electricity currently makes up about 40% of, of gas use, so it's a very relevant sector. Um, and globally, we see that gas falls to um, less than 2.5% of power generation by um, 2040. So we see that as basically an effective phase out of very marginal levels of gas left in the system. And that's really not that long after coal. And breaking down to the regional level, we see a maximum five to 10 year delay after coal at most. Um, so it's definite ev evidence um, on the demand side that in the power sector, um, gas is not the future. Um, so the main thing I wanted to talk about today um, is a, a project in Western Australia, um, the Scarborough um, and Pluto project by Woodside Energy, um, which is really an example of a company betting against the world um, implementing the Paris Agreement. I also have a few slides at the end on some work we've done looking at fossil gas in sub-Saharan Africa. So the Woodside um, Woodside Energy Project. Woodside plans to um, develop the offshore Scarborough gas field and to expand its current Pluto LNG processing facility. And um, my colleagues did the first comprehensive assessment of the emissions associated with that project, including scope three emissions, and found that they are significantly larger by about 60% than Woodside's own estimates for the project. Um, and making clear that claims by Woodside that it's a Paris Agreement compatible project are absolutely incorrect. Um, to the contrary, it's a major stranded asset risk if it goes ahead. Um, the full project would release about 1.4 billion tonnes of greenhouse gases over its lifetime. For comparison, that's about three years worth of Australia's current emissions. Um, and it's equivalent to about, the, the annual um, emissions in 2030 are equivalent to two times the emissions cuts that have been achieved through um, all of the solar PV in Australia each year. So it's significant. Um, and of course, if this were to go, to go ahead, other parts of the economy would have to reduce their emissions faster um, in order to meet Australia's climate targets. And I think that's a really relevant thing to take into account when we talk about just transition. Um, Woodside does, oh, I forgot to change slides. So yeah, here we, here we see the emissions associated with the project. Woodside does have a supposed greenhouse gas abatement plan, um, although it's clear that this doesn't really reduce emissions in any substantive sense. Um, there's a, a significant amount of hot air in the um, plan because it's based on a 2007 estimate of what the project was supposed to be when it was planned to be much bigger. So already just by having a smaller project, they've saved emissions in theory. Um, there's also a heavy reliance on offsets and um, including tree planting, which I don't think we need to talk, talk here about why that's not a solution. And um, in fact, about 50% of shareholders voted against Woodside's climate report because it was too vague and had a big over-reliance on offsets. 
Um, it also defers most emissions reductions to after 2040. And um, it's clear that Woodside has not really factored in the costs of these offsets. Um, and so the, um, this analysis in the bottom right hand corner here shows what could the cost of offsetting uh, Woodside's emissions be um, under different carbon price scenarios. And um, they found that costs could reach up to 21 to 71% of LNG export revenues in the future. So seriously potentially undermining the project's bottom line. It's not just emissions that's um, a risk for this project, it's also um, a, a bet that LNG um, demand will continue in the future. Um, and um, so here you can see in the dark grey uh, the rest of Australia's production ca capacity in light grey Western Australia where this project is based and then the, the very light grey is um, production capacity from this new additional capacity that's um, being planned in this Pluto project. And for comparison the yellow line shows what the IEA's net zero scenario projects for LNG exports from Australia. And that peaks around the time that this project, the Scarborough Pluto project would come online and then declines extremely rapidly. So so clearly the IEA net zero scenario is indicating a potential collapse in the LNG market um, for Australia and key markets such as um, Japan and Korea are, if we look at what they're doing domestically, looking at green hydrogen, for example, um, definitely not worth betting on them being um, future buyers. Um, it's also worth highlighting this project is connected to other domestic projects within Australia, so a, a urea project and a hydrogen project that have committed to take some of the, um, the gas instead of decarbonising those. So this points to further lock in domestically in Australia to gas rather than um, spending investment on, on decarbonisation. Um, so I think the, key, the clear conclusion from this case study is that in, in, if, if this project is to go ahead, Woodside is betting against the Paris Agreement from being um, fully implemented. And I think that has clear um, implications for the communities as well that are associated with this project. Of course, it will create jobs for what happens to those communities in the future when it becomes a stranded asset and what are the opportunity costs of pursuing this project rather than um, investing in other options. Um, the next, so just very briefly, I wanted to end with um, a summary of some work that we've done as part of the Climate Action Tracker Consortium on fossil gas in Africa, um, with a bit of a focus on sub-Saharan Africa, although we did also look at Egypt. Um, it's obviously a very, very different context and extremely vulnerable, a set of extremely vulnerable countries, all very different and very complicated, and I can't really cover the complexity in a couple of minutes. Um, but um, as it's going to be in the spotlight this year with the COP um, based in um, Egypt, uh, it thought it's definitely worth um, having a think about and I think these narratives over just transition and whether or not um, given this global context of declining um, gas uh, use in 1.5 pathways what that means for sub-Saharan Africa. So of course the the key priority for countries in this region is to um, expand energy access and achieve sustainable development goals so the question is what role does fossil gas have to play there um, and We've seen that although renewable energy offers increasingly low cost solutions um, for an energy system, so far investments have been far too small. So less than 2% of global renewable energy investments over the last decade um, have gone into the, um, Africa. And um, instead, we've seen substantial investments in fossil fuels. There was a recent analysis um, that showed about, for, by Energy Monitor, that showed about 400 billion US dollars in the pipeline of gas projects in um, Africa. And you can see um, in the figure here, substantial pipeline of fossil fuel assets that's um, in development being, being planned. Um, but thinking back to those first two slides that I showed, of course, declining fossil fuel demand in a 1.5 degree compatible world, does that mean that these, ben these potential benefits from uh, exploiting um, gas reserves that um, proponents suggest are important for um, energy security for development in the region, might those be undermined and instead the, the region saddled with um, expensive stranded assets and um, potentially losing out on a major economic opportunity to invest in renewable energy instead and in, in green hydrogen, for example. Um, and we did in this report a few, um, we looked at a few different countries. So one of those which I'll end on um, is Senegal, which isn't currently a, um, it's not yet producing um, fossil gas for export, but it has discovered reserves of gas. It's also not reliant on gas in its um, energy system 
Um, so we're, we're not, this is definitely not a fossil fuel dependent and not a gas dependent country right now, but um, this is Germany, for example, is very interested in um, developing um, gas export from Sen Senegal. And so it's highlighting really a, a clear risk of the development of um, stranded assets, the um, yeah, opportunity cost of, of going into a fossil, making this a fossil fuel um, reliant economy at a time when really we should be moving out and into renewables. And we did um, a analysis of very, um, looking at the jobs potential, for example, um, comparing a 1.5 renewables based scenario in Senegal with a current policy gas um, fueled development scenario. And when you compare the annual per megawatt hour jobs that that could be, come from both scenarios in the renewable scenario, we found 6,700 jobs per megawatt hour per year. And in the current policies, we've got 1,500. So really um, a clear benefit from pursuing um, not a fossil gas future. Um, and yeah, just to end, I think we've got quite a lot of reports out there um, that I recommend you take a look, um, spanning also some more global look at why gas is the new coal, fossil gas a bridge to nowhere, and then this um, yeah, climate action tracker work on gas in Africa and India. So I would encourage you to take a look. Thank you. Thank you, Claire, for uh, spotlighting all those stranded asset risks in very different parts of the world. We have a couple of minutes left for questions. Um, so I'll invite people to put up their hand if they have questions. Please keep them uh, relatively brief so that uh, we have more time for questions and we can start with two or three. All right, can you hear me? Yeah. Great, well, thank you for that great panel, that great ideas and insights. Um, my question is for Emiliano. Um, you've said how um, energy justice is challenged by indigenous views all the time, and we've seen how this happens every every point of every in every part of the world. But I wonder if um, you have any thoughts on how energy justice, as an analytical framework, can do better in order to capture, you know, um, indigenous uh, needs. I mean, what can be improved from a uh, theoretical framework, perhaps, and in an energy justice as an analytical tool, what can be done to in order to better capture, you know, indigenous um, reflections? Yeah. Thank you. We'll take one or two other questions, and then you can respond. Uh, yeah, my question is to whoever wants to take it, uh, because I think there was a lot of discussion. We need the rents for the transition, so we need to finance the transition either with a new gas or new whatever, or more fossil fuels or minerals. Um, have you found other more progressive uh, approaches or discourses to how can countries finance this transition? Thank you. Hi, thanks, Chris uh, from uh, Uni Flensburg. Uh, my uh, question goes to you, Claire. Um, can you say a bit more about like uh, plans of like uh, you looked into gas and um, how the producers' plans compare to plans in like national outlooks and stuff? I mean, one thing is of course uh, what we where we need to go to. And the other thing is, um, like EU and others, uh, how what they, um, yeah, forecast kind of in their plans of, of natural gas use and how that uh, might fit or not to those um, expansion plans. Thank you. Thank you, Claire. Do you maybe want to start us off, and then we'll move to em Emiliano? Um, yeah, good question. To be honest, um, no, <laughs> um, we haven't looked at that. Um, I guess, yeah, one good place to start would be, for example, looking at even at the um, IEA current policies scenario as a comparison. Um, but yeah, I think that would be an interesting uh, question to look at. Great, thanks. Emiliano, yeah. uh, how can the justice do better? Yeah, uh, thank you for your question. Um, I think it, needs to engage 
with, uh, let's call it non-Western perspectives in the first place. And by that, I mean, of course, we can read some of the different um, authors that have written on energy justice, but before uh, incorporating their uh, ideas or trying to apply their ideas automatically into our, our studies, I think uh, we need to take a look first at the social and geographical or historical context in which different injustices are being reproduced. And then um, also to consider like these different uh, perspectives, but not like incorporating within the existing frameworks, but rather to take a, a, a look at maybe the similarities or differences and see how can we think, uh, you know, beyond uh, or this Western understandings of justice that is also, for example, reflected on, on the idea that it has to be, a, 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 for example, a win-win situation in, in these conflicts over pipelines or that justice can only be achieved through uh, the, I don't know, like existing uh, legal institutions like the courts. So, for example, uh, many uh, indigenous communities across North America are uh, calling for land back, meaning that it is about decision making power over what happens on their lands. So, and the, I think that it, this idea disrupts completely, like uh, the concept, conceptions of justice that are being uh, um, put forward by the government. So, I think, the, yeah, I mean, this is one way in which. Uh, the, the concept of energy justice can be advanced for the benefit. Thank you. And then there's a tricky question about how can countries finance this transition? And perhaps um, some of the other speakers would want to weigh in here, Felipe. Yeah, thank you very much for the question. Um, I think it has two parts that are very important to highlight. So first, the idea of having to find alternative ways to finance the transition instead of rents from fossil fuels or other uh, commodities. And I think that has to do with something that, that uh, Julia uh, uh, showed also, and that is also overcoming the idea of depending on rents and of restoring past wrongs. <laughs> And this, this brings the, the notion of justice to the forefront. And here, I think there are some very interesting proposals uh, already in, in circulation. So first, the idea of climate reparations that has been, amongst others, voiced uh, in, in, the, in the last COP and by academics such as Keston Perry, um, that it calls out the fact that this mess we find ourselves in uh, is a part of a colonial legacy uh, that has not been uh, corrected and that reparation is uh, a, a very important component different than overseas development aid or loans or other forms of, of funding and the second one uh, which uh, goes brings us to to what uh, is o o also being proposed by the new Colombian government is this idea of uh, climate protection debt relief or debt swaps um, to fund the transition. So basically, unburdening countries in the global south from their external debt, so that with the uh, uh, resulting additional fiscal space, they can fund the transition themselves. That is less progressive, so to say, from this, this climate uh, justice or, or decolonial perspective, but it's also very discussed. Finally, then we can always go back to the extractives and continue as we are, no? Uh, but I think uh, I don't need to convince you that that may not be what we want. Thanks, Felipe. Um, and Josh and Julia, I'm just wondering if you guys have anything to add from your perspectives. The US is also struggling to finance the transition. And I guess it also raises the question of what we are actually financing and what we should be financing. So any re short reflections from your sides? Um, yeah, I mean, I don't think the US is as reliant on the uh, what what you all term 
rents um, to finance the transition, but we are very reliant on the resource. Um, and so in some ways, I wonder maybe if that begs the question of whether the of consuming countries, I mean, obviously we consume all of, most, all, most of the oil we produce and we import a little bit as well. So we are contributing, I guess, to, to the, the finance issues that other countries are having in terms of that decoupling. Um, so it begs the question of if we kind of finance our transition away from that overconsumption of the resource, uh, does that free up resources? Or does that change the resource flow so that this kind of um, assumed dependence um, on those rents uh, is diminished. Um, I mean, I think Canada is another really good uh, example of this because that, yeah, the Trans Mountain pipeline is justified, you know, a multi billion dollar investment from the government into a pipe, privately owned pipeline, uh, justified as, oh, well, the oil for that will, will pay for the transition, even though the cost of the pipeline is higher than the investment that they can hope to get out of that pipeline. So it's a, it's a really unfortunate um, piece of rhetoric. Uh, in the US, I don't think that's part of the rhetoric. I don't, I don't hear that. Um, and the Inflation Reduction Act, you know, the all oil did maybe was slightly offset the cost of that, that uh, investment, but that investment was made and it's, you know, hundreds of billions of dollars. So I don't think that's a limitation uh, for us. So it, it, I think, behooves wealthy countries to just make the investment uh, to kind of focus new investment in our budgets on this uh, instead of traditional things uh, with, like defense and things like that. <laughs> I think that's one, one of the really valuable aspects of this panel that we have so many different perspectives and settings where this discussion needs to take place. Julia, do you have any closing words reflecting on this or um, of your own? Yes, I think my take on this question is not that a macro perspective because I'm an anthropologist. I think I'm not the person to ask such a big question. Even for one country, I can't give that answer. But from my um, research, what I think um, can be one pillar and one way out is really to decentralize the energy systems. Because for example, in Ecuador, two thirds of the revenues um, from oil are actually used for subsidies in the transport sector, etc. So I think um, when then these revenues break away, like one big thing will be like how to secure access to energy. So I think then we have to think about really local solutions to this. So I mainly work in the Amazon. So I think um, there they have like a, a special like leverage because they are the Amazon, they are the lungs of the earth. So I think we can, like they can pretty good advertise this outside and search for other cop like more direct, let's say bilateral corporations with like international development agency, whatever that is, or NGOs and so on, and maybe try to be less dependent on the central government. I think that would be a big move for decolonization as well, thinking about like their self-determination, etc. So I think that's like, but that's just speaking for that region I know within Ecuador, not thinking about the urban centers, etc. So there I'm also without a good answer, I think. Thank you, Julia. All right, so we're really at time and I don't want to stand between you and the final closing session. Uh, but just really wanted to thank our speakers for bringing their very diverse perspectives from so many parts of the world. I think it's really necessary if we're building a research community, building a movement to keep sharing ideas and insights and realizing you know, what patterns exist, what differences, what we can learn from each other. Um, and also just really found uh, Julia's words inspiring to, for us to bear in mind that just transition isn't happening in a vacuum that we need to keep the power aspects in mind as we deal with this topic and and question you know to what problem is just transition a so solution and to what extent is climate change a symptom of another problem and that can really help inform our work going forward i think an anthropologist's view is a uh, is useful in these discussions as well. So thank you all very much for being here and a big thank you to the speakers again. Mm.